Hello, I'm Ross Royden, the Vicar of Christchurch Kowloon Tong here in Hong Kong. Welcome to our broadcast service of the Eucharist for the Sunday next before Lent. A special welcome to any joining us from outside of Hong Kong. Just as COVID is no respecter of geographical borders, so too our faith transcends all boundaries and barriers. Please see our Facebook page for the readings for this week's service and for more information. Search on Facebook for Christchurch Kowloon Tong. Sadly, as all churches have been instructed to close, Christchurch itself will not be open on Sunday for private prayer, as has previously been the case during the pandemic, and the sacrament will not be available. This is something I deeply regret and can only apologise for. This broadcast is produced in-house, so I hope you will take that into account when watching and listening. However, all services, in whatever form they take, should be not about professionalism and performance, but about participation. We hope that this broadcast enables you to participate in some way in the sacred mysteries. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Hear the words of comfort our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear what St. Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear what St. John says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. 
you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Collect and Readings for this week, the Sunday next, before Lent. Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us grace to perceive his glory, that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, beginning to read at the 29th verse. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near. And he gave them in commandment all that the Lord has spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, beginning to read at the 12th verse. Since we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom." And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We've renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, as it is written in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning to read at the 28th verse. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and the disciples kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, 
I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him and all at once he shrieks. It throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. All were astounded at the greatness of God. Everyone was amazed at all that he was doing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. For our gospel reading for the second Sunday before Lent, we read St. Luke's account of the calming of the storm. After relating this event, St. Luke describes Jesus' healing of the man with demons in the country of the Gerasenes. He then describes the healing of the woman with the hemorrhage and the raising of Jairus' daughter. In a significant development, St. Luke also describes how Jesus sends out the 12 men he has chosen as apostles to proclaim the kingdom of God, giving them power and authority over demons and diseases. News of all this reaches King Herod, who, having had John the Baptist killed, doesn't know what to make of what he hears. When the apostles return from their mission, Jesus takes them away privately to Bethsaida. The crowds, however, find out and follow them. Jesus welcomes them and then, as the day draws to a close, performs one of his most famous miracles, feeding 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish. In an important passage, St. Luke then describes how Jesus asks his disciples who the crowds say that he is. There are various ideas circulating about his identity. When Jesus asks who the disciples themselves say that he is, Peter replies that he is the Messiah of God. Jesus commands them not to tell anyone and warns them of the suffering that lies ahead for him. He uses the prospect of his own suffering and death to teach them what it means to be his disciple. Anyone wanting to be his disciple must also both be willing to deny themselves and also be prepared to suffer. A disciple's focus is not to be on themselves in this life, but on Jesus and the life to come. One day, Jesus will come in glory, and anyone who is ashamed of him now, Jesus says, he will be ashamed of when he comes. Jesus closes this passage by telling them that some who are there with him will not die before they see the kingdom of God. This is a saying that has caused much discussion and argument. What did Jesus mean? And when would they see the kingdom of God? Did Jesus, for example, expect the kingdom of God to come in his lifetime? And did he simply get it wrong? This brings us to this week's Gospel reading about what is known as the Transfiguration and what happens immediately after it. The fact that the Transfiguration itself immediately follows this saying of Jesus about some not dying before seeing the kingdom of God, suggests that for St. Luke, and indeed for the other gospel writers as well, that this saying is in some way fulfilled in the transfiguration. The kingdom of God and the coming of the Son of Man are all fulfilled in the person of Jesus himself. The transfiguration anticipates the future coming of Jesus in glory. The coming of the kingdom of God and the coming of Jesus are ultimately one and the same event. St. Luke links these sayings of Jesus and the transfiguration by writing that he was about eight days later that Jesus took with him three of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and goes up a mountain to pray. We have no idea which mountain it was, but that hasn't stopped people speculating. Mount Tabor is the traditional site, but we simply do not know. While Jesus is praying, his appearance changes. Moses and Elijah appear in glory to talk with him about his departure, which Jesus is to accomplish in Jerusalem. 
The events that lie ahead of Jesus are known to him. The disciples are near sleep, as they will be in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the time of Jesus' departure has arrived. The impression St. Luke gives us is that the disciples are overwhelmed by what is happening. But despite this, they see Jesus' glory and the two men who are with him. Peter doesn't know what to make of all this, but sensing that something very special is taking place, suggests making three dwellings, one for each figure, Jesus included. As Peter is still speaking, a cloud overshadows them. As they enter the cloud, they are terrified, and from the cloud there comes a voice that says the well-known words, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice has finished speaking, they see that Jesus is now alone. We are not told how Peter knew the two figures were Moses and Elijah. However, that Peter thinks that Jesus is their equal and wants to build Jesus a dwelling alongside Moses and Elijah shows the esteem in which he holds Jesus. Moses and Elijah are the two towering figures of the Hebrew Scriptures, and both are recorded as having met with God on a mountain. Some commentators say we should see Moses as representing the law and Elijah the prophets. It isn't clear, however, that this is St. Luke's own understanding. There is, though, no doubting the importance of the meeting between Jesus and Moses and Elijah. But Jesus isn't simply a continuation of the great figures through whom God has spoken in the past. This is something entirely new. The voice tells them they are to listen only to Jesus and see only him. One of the best commentaries on this, albeit not written for that purpose, is the opening of the letter to the Hebrews. The writer says, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. After this mountaintop experience, the disciples have to come back down to earth. As they descend the mountain, they are confronted with a crowd and a problem. A man has a son who is demon-possessed. The father tells Jesus that he has begged Jesus' disciples to cast it out, but they have been unable to do so. Jesus then responds quite severely. Jesus says, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. It is not immediately clear who Jesus is speaking to, but it certainly includes the disciples who lack the faith needed to deliver and heal the boy. Jesus may have been transfigured on the mountain. The three disciples who were with him may have seen the glory which will one day be revealed for all to see. But for now they must live by faith as they confront the forces of evil in the world. I want to think about what this can teach us under three headings. Transcendence, transfiguration, and transform transformation. First, transcendence. The phrase mountaintop experience is often used to describe an intense spiritual experience. Mountains in the ancient world were considered places where the spiritual world was closest. The idea that mountains are spiritual places still lingers in our collective consciousness, but we generally recognize nowadays that genuine spiritual experiences can occur anywhere. In the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, who appear in our Gospel reading, are both famously associated with mountaintop experiences. Such experiences in the Bible are accompanied by an overwhelming awareness of the presence of God and of his holiness and greatness. This awareness of the presence of God is not something that can be manufactured. Our worship, nevertheless, should be open to it and encourage us to be receptive to the possibility. 
There is, I think, a small but growing dissatisfaction with the shallowness and emptiness of many of our church services. This is reflected in the number of people being drawn to the Latin Tridentine Mass and to the liturgies of the Orthodox Church that seem to have at their heart the recognition of the otherness of God. There is certainly a challenge for us here. In the past, and certainly in Anglicanism in the past, reverence was often confused with formality. When liturgical reform got underway in the 20th century, one of the criticisms from those who wanted to keep the old liturgies was that the new liturgies were shallow and irreverent. But what was often meant by this was no more that they, that, than that they didn't follow the traditional way of doing things. It needs to be said that often the traditional way of doing things was stuffy, rigid, formal, and unwelcoming. They were, I'm afraid, more expressive of a certain middle-class ethos than they were of an openness to the spirit. This has largely changed. Some services are now so informal that it is hard to tell they are services at all. Others have become so focused on the experience of the worshipper that it is hard to see exactly where God fits in, except as the supposed provider of emotional highs. In Hong Kong, not so long ago, one church advertised tickets for sale to a worship experience. Services have become concerts, so why not sell tickets to them? Some, myself included, find ourselves in a difficult position. I cringe when I hear talk of worship sets. I find it disturbing that worship leader has become another term for someone who leads the singing and whose job it is to make sure everyone has a good time. But the last thing I want is a return to the sort of services that were once all too common in Anglican churches. Cold, formal, and yes, boring. I still to this day have unpleasant flashbacks whenever I hear Anglican chant. I freely accept that the role of the contemporary worship leader is no different in principle to the traditional role of a choir master who also was more concerned about the musical experience of the choir and congregation than they were of the worship of God. Bands or organs, choruses or anthems, ultimately there is no difference. All too often, they are about us and not about God. But worship is not, or at least it should not be, about us having a good time or enjoying the service. What matters in worship is not what I want, feel, or like, but God. Worship should always have as at its focus the person and presence of God, and that means it will not always be enjoyable or comfortable. Indeed, it will often be deeply disturbing and demanding as we weak and miserable sinners find ourselves exposed and confronted by the holiness and majesty of God. Worship will also build us up, strengthen us for service, and, at times, even be enjoyable. But it will, at the same time, always be painful and challenging, and it should always be about God. At the Transfiguration, God's transcendent presence was experienced during prayer, and for the three disciples who were present, it was both overwhelming and disorienting. At the end, the only response that could be was silence, something that many modern-day worshippers have yet to experience in all the noise that passes as worship. Secondly, transfiguration. The disciples had committed to following Jesus because they were convinced that he was, as St. Peter puts it, the Christ of God. What exactly they themselves understood by this, we don't know, and they probably didn't fully either. It certainly, however, involved the nation of Israel, the defeat of her enemies, and the coming of God's kingdom on earth. There would also be many blessings and benefits for those who were on the Messiah's side. The Messiah was a Davidic type figure who would lead Israel as God's people against those who opposed her and oppressed her. 
It involved more than this, but not less. The Messiah himself would, by definition, be an amazing person. He would be a God-anointed person, someone whom God was with in a special way. But he would be human, nevertheless. As I said in the sermon for the third Sunday of Epiphany, Jesus, when he was growing up, seemed all too human and not particularly special. That was the problem for the people of his hometown of Nazareth. Jesus was asking them to believe that he, an ordinary local lad, was the one spoken about in the prophets. You can understand why they might have had difficulties with believing this, even if trying to kill him might seem to be a bit of an overreaction. Jesus, by healing people and casting demons out of them, not to mention his miracles such as the calming of the storm and the feeding of the 5,000, seemed to fit the job description for the Messiah. The problem was that Jesus seemed reluctant to apply for the job and unwilling to capitalize on people's enthusiasm for him. Jesus told his disciples not to tell anyone who he was, and people such as Jairus, whose daughter he healed, were told to keep quiet about what he had done for them. That didn't seem the way the Messiah should behave. Surely Jesus, if he really was the Messiah, would want everyone to know that this was who he was. Now, to make matters worse, Jesus has started talking about defeat and death. Is this to be put down to an understandable and all too human fear of failure on his part? The Gospel writers all make clear that Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah. In fact, so central was this conviction in the early church to the faith of believers that the title Christ, which means Messiah in Greek, became part of Jesus' name. But Jesus was a very different sort of Messiah to what they had been expecting, and it was only after his death and resurrection that his followers were able to work it out and understand it. What is more, the title Christ was not sufficient by itself to describe who he was. Who then was he? This was the question that the disciples had asked themselves after Jesus had calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Now on the mountain, three of his closest disciples are given a brief insight into his true identity as he is transfigured before him, before them and his glory revealed. This is God's son, not just in the sense that the king of, kings of Israel were God's son, but in a unique and exclusive way. The disciples, when they see Moses and Elijah, assume that Jesus must be a figure like them, special but human, another great prophet certainly, and one to be honored alongside the great prophets in Israel's history, but not fundamentally different to them. St. Peter suggests the equivalent of a chapel in honor of each figure, but he doesn't know what he is saying. This is God's son. Moses and Elijah have fulfilled their role and played their part. Honor is indeed due to them, and they appear in glory to speak with Jesus about what he has been sent to do. Now, however, it is to God's Son alone that the disciples must listen. The challenge to us should be clear. We too want a human Jesus. We are happy for him to be a teacher, a prophet, someone exceptional even, but still human and just one among many. We want to be able to get our truth where we find it, whether from Moses or from whatever other prophet we find congenial to us. But Jesus isn't another prophet or teacher. He is God's chosen son, and it is to him we must now listen and no one else. As we see Jesus transfigured and his glory revealed, we need to regain our confidence in him and listen only to him. Thirdly, transformation. All this can seem somewhat theoretical and even irrelevant to us, and of course we think everything has to be relevant and relevant to us here and now. In fact, it is intensely relevant to us. St. John writes, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. One day, we will be like Jesus himself. 
St. Paul goes further and writes in our second reading that even now we are being transformed into the image of Christ. St. Paul writes, And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This section of what is known as St. Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth is really quite remarkable and draws on imagery taken from the experience of Moses and the people of Israel. When Moses came down from the mountain, having been in the presence of God, his face glowed. In order to spare the Israelites any anxiety that might come from having to look at him, Moses covered his face with a veil to hide it. Using this image of a veil, St. Paul writes that when people now read the law, it is as if there is a veil to prevent them from understanding it. It is only when people turn to the law that the veil is removed and we are able to see, albeit imperfectly, the glory of the Lord in it. Having applied this image of a veil, preventing people from seeing God's truth in the law, St. Paul extends the image to all unbelievers, and not just those such as the Jews who read the books of Moses. St. Paul tells the Corinthian believers that he openly states the truth. But why then don't more people respond? Why do so many seem not to be able to understand the truth? St. Paul explains, and even if our gospel is his, start again, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. God himself must shine his light into lives. We need God to reveal the glory of Christ to us. It is as God does so that we not only see Christ's glory, but are transformed by it. Sometimes when we preach, when we preach the gospel, although it is, it is preached faithfully and clearly, it seems as if there is something that is holding people back and preventing them from understanding what is being preached. Something is preventing them from coming to faith in Christ. That something is a someone. And the someone is the God of this world, who has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they are unable to understand what we are saying, no matter how hard we try or how clear our proclamation. No amount of debate, preaching or argument, no matter how good and well presented, can of itself get through to people with the truth of the gospel. God needs to work an act of creation each time. The knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. But we need God to shine his light into the darkness of our hearts for us to be able to see it. How we hate being told this. We want more than anything to believe we are free to choose that any decision about whether we have faith in Christ or not is ours to make. The truth is that if we are left to ourselves to make the decision, we will never make it because we are not free to make it. We don't have free will. God must free our will by his Spirit, for where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Otherwise, however, we are bound and blinded by the God of this world, unable to see, unable to believe, and unable to understand the truth of the gospel. The boy possessed by a demon in our gospel reading is a dramatic example of the demonic hold the God of this world has on all people. The Spirit, however, enables us to see the glory of God in Christ. And he works in us the transformation we need to share in the image of Christ and to become like him. This transformation begins when the Spirit frees our will so that we can come to faith in Christ and see his glory. We are, even now, in the darkness of this world and in the frailty of our humanity, experiencing the glory of Christ, transforming us and changing us from one degree of glory to another. But it won't be until Christ returns that our transformation will finally be complete. Until then, as St. Paul writes, 
we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are not, St. Paul tells us, to expect life in this world to be easy. St. Paul knew what he was talking about. He writes of being afflicted, perplexed, persecuted and struck down. Despite all his suffering for Christ, he can describe it as a slight momentary affliction which is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. What St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians reinforces what I was saying in the sermon for the third Sunday before Lent. What happens to us here and now is to prepare us for our life hereafter. Our hope lies not in this world, controlled as it is by the God of this world. No, as St. Paul writes, we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain was a unique historical event that revealed his glory to his three disciples. But we too have been given to see his glory and to be transformed by it. We face many challenges in this life and often much suffering and pain. But as St. Paul says in our reading, we don't lose heart. May God grant us to experience his transcendent presence in Christ as Christ is transfigured before us and experiencing it. May we be transformed by it from one degree of glory to another. Amen. Let us confess our faith in Almighty God as we say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promise through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Strengthen Andrew, our Archbishop, Timothy, our Bishop, and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Bless and guide our leaders, give wisdom to all in authority, and direct this community and all nations in the ways of justice and of peace, that we may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and of all your saints, 
We commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It'll become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. Through to the vine and work of human hands, it'll become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, 
Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Grace is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom, all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy God, we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. May we who are partakers at his table reflect his life in word and deed, that all the world may know his power to change and save. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.